Are you in violation of the three things that could be messing up your metabolism? Well, unfortunately, there's a good chance that you are. And these are things that you might not be able to completely eliminate, but they're things that you can at least be cognizant of. Because in the world of science, the world of research, it's constantly evolving. The things that affect our bodies, the things that affect our metabolisms are different from week to week. So what I'm gonna lay out for you here are the three things that I think are the biggest metabolism disruptors. You may hate me for some of them, but the fact is this is where the science lies and this is where my opinion at least lies. So let's go ahead and let's dive in. I do wanna make sure you hit that red subscribe button and then hit that little bell icon so you never ever miss a beat on my channel here. Number one, one that you probably are well aware of is stress. Stress has a huge effect on our metabolism. Hey, no surprise, right? We're always told to chill out. In fact, we're told to chill out so much, it probably stresses us out more than anything. See, there was a 2011 study that was published in the journal Nature that took a look at 88 people, and they found that when they had any kind of traumatic stressor, they had a significant increase in ghrelin. Now, by now, if you've watched my channel, you know that ghrelin is the hunger hormone. But if we have a constant elevation of this ghrelin, then of course, yes, we're constantly hungry, but we're also disrupting our metabolism. So the study actually expanded a little bit further into rats. And here's what they did. Okay, so they took a look at rats and they immobilized them to trigger some stress, right? So they just restrained them and it triggered a lot of stress. And then they compared that to rats that were able to just roam freely. Well, of course, the rats that were immobilized were under stress. Well, what did they find? They found that in a very short amount of time, the rats that were immobilized ended up having two times as much the ghrelin levels as the rats that were able to just roam around freely. The point is, it's a quick response. You get under stress, your ghrelin levels go up and you eat more. And you don't know what you're going to eat because you're, you're so hungry, you just eat. That is, in effect, directly and indirectly, a metabolic disruptor. So you may hate me for it because it's vague and it's hard to reduce your stress levels, but it's a big deal. You are better off to chill out on the training, you're better off to chill out on your diet for just a minute, and you're better off to take a day off and take a dang sick day if you need to, than you are forcing yourself to go through the grind. Okay, you're going to have a better metabolic benefit in the end by possibly eating that piece of cheesecake but not being stressed out about it for a week, than stressing about it for an entire week or month. I know, that's, take that with a grain of salt or at least with a slice of cheesecake. All right, on to the next one, gluten. I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but gluten, in my opinion, is a serious problem. Okay, gluten is a protein that is indigestible to begin with. There's no denying that. But there are a lot of people that'll say, hey, there's no concrete evidence that shows that gluten really is bad unless you have celiac disease. Well, I beg to differ. There's actually some pretty interesting science out there. You see what happens is when you consume gluten, it triggers the production of a protein called zonulin within the body. Well, because gluten is indigestible, it does trigger our intestinal lining to sort of open up a little bit more. It's called a leaky gut. And what that means is larger pieces of protein can get into the bloodstream. Things like this zonulin, right? So when this protein, zonulin, is in the bloodstream, it triggers specific antibodies. And these antibodies go to attack the protein. It's just what they're supposed to do because there's larger molecules coming into the bloodstream, the body has to attack them to some degree. Well, guess what? It turns out the antibody that affects zonulin also seems to affect thyroid tissue, especially in those with autoimmune thyroid disease, which when we look at the big picture, unfortunately, it looks like a lot of us could be suffering from autoimmune thyroid disease and not even know it because the tests aren't generally conducted. My wife walked around for like half a decade not knowing what was wrong until someone finally ran the right test and found that she had autoimmune thyroid disease. She had Hashimoto. The point is not everyone has some clinical diagnosis, but it is too much of a risk to just keep consuming gluten well, gluttonously, haha, <laughs> play on words. Okay, so my point is when you look at how this reacts with thyroid tissue, we could be hindering our thyroid. We could be limiting how well the thyroid works. In fact, there was a study that was published in Experimental and Clinical Endocrinology and Diabetes that found that when people that were suffering from autoimmune thyroid disease went on a gluten-free diet for six months, they had a significant improvement in their autoimmune thyroid disorder markers, okay? So their thyroglobulin went down and their TPO antibodies went down. And what does this mean if you don't suffer from Hashimoto's? Well, it just means that somewhere along the lines, directly or indirectly, we seem to be having an issue with gluten and its effect on our thyroid. Now, again, at the end of the day, gluten is a protein that is indigestible anyway. So it's kind of a waste but it's the overconsumption of it over the last 50, 60, 70 years that is probably triggering this antibody response. It's speculating a little bit, but the research is there, we just don't have the exact correlation and causation yet. The hard part is you go to the doctor and they see that your thyroid levels are low and they don't generally test the next step. They don't test the antibody levels. 
They say, oh, your thyroid levels are low, you probably need to eat a little bit less, you need to lose weight, you need to exercise more, which could actually make the problem worse. Sometimes people with thyroid issues actually need to eat more and they need to maybe exercise a little bit less, but they need to get certain foods out of the diet. So in my opinion, it makes my list as a big metabolic disruptor. Now, if you do want some gluten-free treats and things like that, I highly recommend you check out Thrive Market. Okay, they're a big, big sponsor of this channel, but they're also just awesome when it comes down to healthy gluten-free snacks. So I have intermittent fasting boxes, I have keto boxes, all kinds of grocery boxes that I've assembled with foods that I would normally get at the grocery store that you can get through Thrive delivered right to your doorstep. So when I'm talking about foods that are metabolic disruptors, it's always good to replace them with good healthy foods. And that's why I'm a huge fan of Thrive Market. So go ahead and check them out. There's a special link down below in the description. So after you watch this video, after I talk about this third metabolic disruptor, I think you're gonna get a big kick out of some of the things that you can get on my grocery list at Thrive. So check them out down below after this video. The last one that I wanna talk about today, and trust me, there's a laundry list more, but you're gonna hate me for this one, I hate to even say it, it's artificial sweeteners. And I know a lot of you watching my channel uh, do keto, you practice intermittent fasting, and sometimes just having those things with some artificial sweeteners are just, just the saving grace in a world where you're craving things. And please don't get me wrong, everything in moderation, okay? I'm not saying don't ever have artificial sweeteners. I'm not saying be a complete militant, just jerk, just, you can relax, but don't make it a daily thing. See, the artificial sweeteners that are in focus today at this video are gonna be saccharin, the little pink packets, but I don't know who uses those anymore anyway. Okay, then we have uh, Splenda, sucralose, and then we have aspartame, okay, or equal, right? So what are we looking at here? Well, it turns out that there's some issues with glucose intolerance, but more importantly, gut dysbiosis. Now, before you turn off this video because you're thinking, I don't wanna hear about the gut biome, it's so boring, please, you're gonna be fascinated with some of the science that I lay out. So there was a study that was published in the journal Nature, once again, okay, that took a look at mice in this particular case. Now again, hear me out because we transfer to humans here in a minute. Okay, Took a look at mice and they fed them these artificial sweeteners, right? These three different kinds. Well, they found that they developed glucose intolerance whenever they consume these artificial sweeteners. Yeah, we used to think that you have to consume glucose or have to consume carbohydrates to get glucose intolerant. Wrong. Artificial sweeteners can actually make you glucose intolerant. But it wasn't just the simple act of eating it. It was what it was doing to their gut biome because they took the gut bacteria from the mice that consumed artificial sweeteners and they transferred it into mice that had no bacteria in their gut at all. They were bacteria-free mice. Well, guess what? When they transferred the bacteria to those mice, they developed glucose intolerance too. Well, then when we expand this study over to humans, they took a look at humans and they said, okay, you're gonna consume uh, these artificial sweeteners for a week and they normally don't consume them. So, at the end of one week, four out of seven of the participants developed glucose intolerance already. One week of artificial sweeteners. But it didn't stop there, okay? They took the gut bacteria from these humans and transferred them into mice. Guess what the result was? The mice developed glucose intolerance when they received the bacteria from the humans. Meaning that it doesn't even matter, crossing species, the gut bacteria changed so much to a point where it actually affected the metabolism of glucose, making them glucose intolerant. This is a world of hurt, and this is everything that is wrong with our diets and society, right? We just have so much carbohydrate and glucose consumption to the point where we become glucose intolerant. So in an effort to try to make life a little easier and healthier by having artificial sweeteners, looks like we're just doing ourselves a disservice. You're almost better off to just have a little glucose now and then, but you're better off to just keep it out of the equation. Anyhow, I can go on and on and on. I'll probably redo this video each year because things are always changing and everything's always evolving. So as always, everything that I talk about in these videos is for informational purposes, right? Okay, this is all laid out in research. This is all laid out in papers, but I try to bring to you what I think are the most important details at a given point in time. So don't hate on me if things change as time goes on. Don't hate on me if I redo this video in a year and change what I think are the big three metabolic disruptors. It's not just for creating content, it's because things change and we always have an evolution of this kind of stuff. One thing that I can promise you is that I'll always give you the facts. I'll always give you the details and I'll always give you the studies so that you can look for yourself. So if you ever wanna poke holes in my videos, please go right ahead because you have to challenge your own hypothesis. You have to challenge the things that I'm presenting out to you. So as always, please do keep it locked in here on my channel. New videos almost every single day at 7 a.m. Pacific time, sometimes earlier, all over the place, whenever. See you soon.